people. People say, what did you do? I went to a talk on the King James Bible. I'm going to hand round one page from the Old Testament, from Jeremiah, and one page from the New Testament, in this case from the, the Epistle to the Colossians, um, and look at them and pass them on to the next people. Make sure I get them back at the end. They're in plastic so that they won't get damaged, but don't bend them too much more than you have to. Um, and that will give you a sense of what it looked like when it first came out. Okay, so let's let's start this here. Uh, if you'd like to look at it, and let's start this at the back uh, so that it can go backwards and forwards. It means everyone will have touched the page from 1611. Because until maybe 150 years ago, a copy from 1611 was just an old copy of the Bible that was difficult to read. And people wanted a better, better printed one. So copies got worn out and leaves got taken out of them. And so we have some available leaves like that. This is the library where I work, and people said, who owns this book? We've been collecting books since 1803, just over 200 years. And these books, some of them were given, and some of them were bought a long time ago when books were much cheaper. Um, and they come together to make a collection. Almost everything that I've put on here is, is from our collections, not absolutely everything. We don't have a Gutenberg Bible. Uh, the <coughs> talk is based on an exhibit that I did last year. I, uh, by chance, there was a librarian from Harvard in while I had this exhibit on. And she told me what she'd put in her King James Bible exhibit. <coughs> she had eight books, very important books but not enough to tell the story. But we were able to tell the whole story from our collections, which is why I've got it for you now. Just over 400 years ago, King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England. And people were filled with hope and apprehension. He thought of himself as a learned king. And when he, he was also a king who had been raised as a Presbyterian, with a Roman Catholic mother, but he'd been raised as a Presbyterian, and he was coming to be king of an Episcopalian country, both Protestant, but different kinds of Protestants. And one of the first things that he did was to call a conference at Hampton Court Palace of people representing different strands of Protestant belief at that time. And the Puritans were filled with hope, the reformers, that this king from Scotland would change everything for them, would carry Reformation further. And the traditionalists, the Episcopalians, were filled with apprehension but were determined that the balance wouldn't be upset. And he basically didn't give very much away to the reformers, until at the very end, somebody asked him, can we have a new translation? It was Dr. Reynolds of Oxford, asked him, the leader of the, of the reformers, can we have a new translation? And he said yes, and I'll come to it later, but the new translation that he gave was put together by the learned men of the age, it's a picture of them sitting around the table, it was a small country. These were small towns that they came from. That's the whole of London there. If you've been watching the Olympics, you know it looks like that from the, from the sky, right? But it's, it's, it was a small place um, down on the left there, round the Mendel River. That's Westminster, where the Bible was printed 
and where the translators met for the final editing. But it was a small place, a small town. It had to be done by people at the time. And this is a little bit out of the title page of the original edition. In England it's called the authorised version rather than the King James Bible because it was authorised to be read in churches and its purpose was public reading. Part of its force has been that it was designed and translated so that it could be read aloud. Newly translated out of the original tongues, it says on the one hand, and with the former translations diligently compared, it says on the other. And it's the factoring between those two things which makes it distinctive. And I'm going to be showing you some of the translations as it looked back to those former translations, diligently compared. Because you'd be surprised at some of the really important passages which are carried forward, which have been known by people in English for many centuries before King, the King James translators, the company of translators. It wasn't all done in a hurry. The King James Bible was a refinement of what had been there. And this is what the translators said about it. Truly, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation. They thought they were just trying to sit as a committee to stop trouble. We never thought we would need a new translation. And yet they, they set out, they thought they were going to make a good translation better, or out of many good ones, one principal good one, not justly to be accepted against. Many translations out of many, many good ones. They tried to be nice about it, but they faced a situation in which there were many, many competing translations, uh, and trouble was coming from them. What was the Bible in English before printing? Well, it doesn't start at the Reformation. It's important to remember that people were talking about the Bible and from the Bible in English for many centuries, particularly before the Norman Conquest, when the English church was loose, more loosely connected with the church on the European continent. Um, and this is a little bit of the Lord's Prayer in Anglo-Saxon. You'll notice that the language changes a great deal after this. But the passages of the Psalms, passages of Genesis, passages from the Gospels were all translated into English in the time before the Norman Conquest. Not the whole Bible. After the Norman Conquest particularly, and through to the Reformation, the standard Bible was in Latin, was Jerome's translation of the Bible into Latin. It's called the Vulgate. And I used to think, as many people think, that this was solely to hide the Bible from people. But it was, Latin was the universal language for a long time. And while it functioned to hide it from people later on, when I was in Nigeria in the early 60s, people would have a King James Bible in one hand, but they would be preaching in Hausa, in the Nigerian language. And they would be telling what they read in English here, in another language, in the language of the people. And we must think of the medieval Bible not as being closeted away completely, particularly from the 13th century onwards, 14th century onwards. There were a lot of Latin Bibles. And some of them were like the Bible on the left, which is a study Bible, designed for people who were learning, reading Latin, looking at all the commentators, the bits in big writing in the middle of the pack, columns, that's the actual text of the Bible. The bit around it is all the commentary on it, because this was a study Bible. And this was a big, big book, 
probably 15 inches high, 16 inches high. The one on the right is a preaching Bible, a smaller, much smaller Bible, like the one that the missionaries in Nigeria would have had, something you could hold in your hand, something you could carry if you were riding on horseback uh, in your pouch. And that's probably only about six or seven inches high, and only about five inches wide on the page, and that's in our collection. This is a Bible from about 1200 in our collection. And there are a lot of medieval manuscript Bibles. Students can't read them, but they represent something historically that it, the Bible was there. But the dissemination to the, most people was not from them reading themselves, but from people extemporaneously translating while they preached. And the passages of the Bible got into the culture from the traveling preachers uh, in, in that time. So in the Middle Ages, later on, the Latin Bible was, was more, um, I think, arcane, but at this time not. What changed it is the story of John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe was a learned man. He was an Oxford philosopher. And he, the century he lived in was a difficult century. Um, not just wars, a lot of wars, a lot of political upheaval, but also um, the Black Death, bubonic plague through Europe, huge depopulation, followed by the what we call the Peasants' Revolt in 1381. And around about that time of political and demographic upheaval, Wycliffe left Oxford and became rector of Lutterworth, of a small town in Leicestershire. And that small town in Leicestershire was a centre of religious change of these travelling preachers called <coughs> the Mollards. And the followers of Wycliffe, not just Wycliffe himself, but the followers of Wycliffe, produced a translation of the whole of the Bible into English. It incorporated bits of language which had been known before, which had been used in the services. But they translated the whole of the Bible. It wasn't new scholarship. They were using the Vulgate. They were translating it from Latin into, into English. They were not translating it from Greek or Hebrew but they accomplished the translation. And it su survives in perhaps 300 manuscripts, which is a huge number. There's probably only 180 manuscripts of Chaucer's poetry. And everyone learns Chaucer's poetry in school, but they don't learn Wycliffe's translation of the Bible, um, because we've got other ones later. But it, it was very wide, and, and it was also repressed. There is, there, after Wycliffe's death, there was a crackdown because of, because of reformers in Czechoslovakia. There was a crackdown across Europe on religious reformers, people like Wycliffe. And it became an offense to own any part of the Wycliffeite translation. Um, and Wycliffe himself was dead by that time, but some of his followers were put to death. Uh, and um, he, his own remains were dug up and scattered as ashes, burnt and scattered as ashes. Why? It's to do with power and control, right? It's not just to do with the religious ideas. The religious ideas were the same religious ideas which had been there in the Latin, right? They're not new ideas. It's to do with how people were commenting on them and who would know what was being said. Um, and some of the most best passages in the Wycliffeite translations are passages from the Gospels about Jesus talking about people, ordinary people. Um, and they are also prophetic passages which tend to be ones which speak to the dispossessed. So that some of the passages from the Wycliffeite translation are really quite remarkable. But I put up a bit which I thought you'd all know, to know um, here. 
and it's the beginning of John's Gospel, but if we go a little bit further down, we come to narrative. A man was sent from God, to whom the name was John, this man came to witnessing that he should bear witness of the light, that all men should believe in him. He was not the light, but that he should bear witnessing of the light. There was a very light that lighteneth each man that cometh into this world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. That translation was done in the 1380s, right? It's very close to what we know from the King James Bible, what we're used to. Um, and the Wycliffe translations fed into later translations, which fed into the King James Bible. So when people heard the King James Bible for the first time, they were hearing a refinement of things they knew quite often, especially in the passages used for services in church. So it goes back, it goes back, and I put Wycliffe in, I wanted a passage because I wanted you to see it. Now the Wycliffe version is before printing, and the reason I put this in, this is a Victorian edition of it, all these little notes at the bottom are every, every manuscript writes things slightly differently. You copy out a manuscript, you always alter things. There was no uniformity because there was no printing. There are two main traditions of Wycliffeite manuscripts, one of which is more literal as a translation of the Vulgate, and one of them is a bit more like a preacher interpreting the stories as he translates them. Two traditions, but lots of differences in them all. So before printing, there could be the motive to translate, and there could be this massive achievement, but there could never be a standard, standardized version for people to, to share. Um, the first printed Bibles, what changed this is printing. The first printed book is a Bible, is the great Gutenberg Bible, which is far too expensive for us to have one. So this is a reproduction of a reproduction of um, Most of them are in black and white, but the man who invented printing set out to print the Bible as his first major book. Huge investment. Uh, and eventually the investors took over. And he, he never um, got the fame in his time that he thought. But the man who invented movable type did some other little printing jobs. But the big one that he did is the Gutenberg Bible. This is what a Renaissance printing shop looked something like. Um, it stayed the same for 350 years after this. Um, people had to set type by hand. People had to ink it. People had to pull on a heavy wooden press. And they couldn't have too big a page because the press would break apart. So they had to pull it twice to do it on a full-size sheet of paper. Um, it was a very labor-intensive piece of work. And this is a picture on the right of a printing press being worked. You can see the amount of physical labor. And that picture is from about 1510. The small format printed book, a Latin Bible, that's a woodcut. All the technology was there. When we're on the web, we want to put in pictures and everything else, don't we, uh, with new technology. Well, they did the same with printing extraordinarily innovative things. And that's a picture of St. Jerome translating. Nobody knew what he looked like, right? But they put it in there. Uh, and, uh, there. But that was the, it's a little book. That's a book about six or seven inches high and about five inches across, and a fat book, because it was a preaching Bible, not a study Bible. They're all translating the same Bible. They're translating the Latin. What changes it is they start studying why that Latin is there. And this Dutchman, Desiderius Erasmus, had learned Greek. And he explored the Greek manuscripts. And he created a new text of the Greek Testament. And that became what's called the Textus Receptus. And that was the basis of the Reformed translation is Erasmus. Erasmus was in exile in England for a little bit, which is why the English scholars knew about him. But he, was, he came from Holland, 
and the German scholars knew about him. Um, but his work was the basis for reconsidering the text of the Greek one. And scholars, not just reform scholars, but Catholic scholars, were entranced by this new scholarship. And in Spain, which we think of as a very backward country, or a very counter-reformation country, as far as religious change in the Renaissance, um, one of the greatest scholarly projects of, of this time, of the Renaissance, is the Complutensian Polygon, which is a version of the Bible with the with the Bible in all the different sources, printed in parallel on the page. Uh, not just the Latin, which is down the middle, and the Hebrew, and the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, on the page, but also bits in Syriac as well. So the scholarly sources for people to know better what was the original language were coming together at the same time as there was a movement for religious reform and there was the technology of printing. So you get a religious impulse of reformation, you get a technological impulse of printing, and you get a scholarly impulse that people really can know what the original language was better. They, they've learned Hebrew and they've learned Greek. They learned Hebrew, Greek before they learned Hebrew. But there are scholars not just working in Latin for the first time for a very long time. So these are the, the ways in which scholarship comes together. Martin Luther, the leader of the Reformation in Germany, knew Erasmus and got to work to translate the Bible into German, into the language of the people. <coughs> And the great Luther Bible has illustrations. It's intended for people who, to be able to follow, who can't necessarily read it for themselves. It would be read aloud to people. But the German Luther Bible, it becomes the model for all reformers uh, across Europe. And in particular, it becomes a model for this man, William Tyndale. William Tyndale had been a student in Oxford and went into exile deliberately to learn about printing and translation. Uh, he'd hoped to get people in England to sponsor him. He probably studied with Erasmus when Erasmus was in England. He hoped to get sponsorship there, but he couldn't uh, because of the religious situation. And he went abroad and he holed up, he had a dreadful life really, he holed up and he did his translation into English himself. And it was printed in, um, partly in Germany and partly in Holland, in 1525 and smuggled back into England. It was not a legal translation at that time. Um, and here is the bit about Martha and Mary, right? And it happened as he went, it fortuned as he went, that he entered into a certain town, a certain woman named Martha received him in her, to her bosom, and this woman had a sister called Mary, who, uh, which sat at Jesus' feet and heard Jesus preaching. And Martha was cumbered about much. Cumbered. I, that survives. That word survives into, into the King James Bible. Much of this, it's, it's, it's a little awkward by comparison with the King James Bible, but some of Tyndale survives. In fact, a lot of Tyndale survives, you'd be surprised. He didn't finish his translation completely. He finished his New Testament. He did some of the Psalms. He did the Pentateuch, the first five books. Um, and then he was captured, and in due course he was executed. Very unlucky. He was executed in 1536. And that was just the time when, if he'd been back in England, he might have been able to survive. He'd only got to hang on about another year, and it would all have been legal. Right? But he was in exile. He accomplished this translation. Um, which of you has a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me four loaves for a friend of mine who's come out of the way, of, way to me. I have nothing to set before him. It has the same ring, doesn't it? 
It's not exactly the same translation, but it has the same ring. But he was executed in 1536 in Belgium, which was under different political control. His translations got spread. The very interesting one from 1530 in England, printing the translation of the Psalms, uh, which was recently discovered. What changed it was political change. Suddenly made it acceptable. Coverdale got, Miles Coverdale, got Tyndale's translations and translated bits of the Vulgate where Tyndale had not got round to it. And Coverdale did not know Hebrew and Greek. He had to rely on other people. But Coverdale put together a complete Bible by 1535, and it was printed abroad. It was still illegal in England. But in due course, it came to the notice of people who were more influential. And there was a parallel, slightly later endeavor, by a man called John Rogers, who was also taking Tyndale's translations. But it was so much fraught politically that he didn't put it, we don't know it as John Rogers' Bible, we know it as Matthew's Bible because he put the wrong name on it so that he wouldn't be associated with him. Coverdale in fact survived, he became a bishop, he went into exile, he came back, he, he lived through all the subsequent changes. Rogers didn't. Rogers was a very, very committed reformer and in due course Rogers was executed in 1553. Um, Rogers' translation. Fifteen thirty-eight political situations changed and they get Coverdale to do a new version of the Coverdale Bible. Mash it all together. Not a lot of new translation mash together everything they've got, get it printed, and the word goes out from Thomas Cromwell to put it in every church. Now there were 13,000 churches in Britain at the time, so it wasn't in every church immediately. And it was to be put in the church, not just at the front on a lectern for someone to read, it was to be put where anybody could go in and look at it. It's part of it's a really very dramatic change. Now, literacy rates in Britain were not that high. But if you think about it, if it's there, one person can read and other people can listen. They're often chained Bibles, you know, on a lectern chain in, in the church so that they wouldn't go away. Uh, but that is most, you know, if you wanted to plan a religious reformation, you wouldn't do all the steps that actually happened in England. But one of the, one of the consequences of Henry VIII's complicated life was that the Bible was placed in every church in England, um, where your parishioners may most commodiously resort to the same and read it. And it had to be the largest volume. That's why we know it was the Great Bible or Coverdale's Bible that was being placed. They didn't want just one of the little study Bibles, particularly they didn't want Tyndale's, which had been uh, New Testament, which had been smuggled in. They wanted one of the ones which had been officially vetted. And almost immediately afterwards, they start having the church services in English. The church services had always been in Latin, partly to make it mysterious, but partly because that way Priests could move from country to country and it would all be the same um, for uniformity. But once the English church had split from the European church, Catholic church, the services were put into English and big chunks of the services are passages of scripture which have to be read aloud, which have to be translated. And for the most part they used Coverdale's translations for instance, of the Psalms. And those, if you are an old-fashioned Episcopalian, you're used to the Psalms which are sung being slightly different from the Psalms which are in the King James Version. And that's because the prayer book still has the Coverdale Psalms in them. Uh, 
but there are wonderful, you know, the, the rhythms, the rhythms of Wycliffe and Tyndale get into the services and become what people think of as religious language and biblical language because that's where you hear it loud. If I think about my own upbringing, right, in school we had morning and evening passages of scripture read, right? We had services. And the state schools did. Right? That was at private schools, but the state schools did. If you think about it, therefore, I heard at least two passages a day, right? Year round for 15, 16 years. It's an awful lot of reading, right? Awful lot of rhythms in one's head. And people didn't have to have it in school, right, for that to be part of the rhythm of life at that time. But it was certainly the rhythm in, in services. Um, you know, there's a, a regression in the, in the English Reformation. Queen Mary becomes queen in 1552, and the leaders of the Reformation either have to recant uh, or they uh, get executed, which is what happened to Latimer, Ridley, and Cranmer. And I'm going to be fair and balanced, as they say on the television in due course, but it's part of the story and part of the value that later generations will put on the King James Bible and the English Bible that people suffered for it, I believe. due course, Queen Elizabeth becomes queen, and one of the first things she does is to restore the English services and in due course the English Bible. Of course, they had to get the bishops together for a committee. They couldn't risk the great Bible again. They go through the whole thing just as King James has to. But the Bishop's Bible of 1568. All this time, everyone isn't agreed. In the 1550s, a whole lot of reformers have been in exile, and they end up in Geneva, the center of reformed religion, home of John Calvin, and they produce a new translation of the Bible, the Geneva Bible. And the Geneva Bible, from 1560 when it first came out, to the 1620s in fact, was the dominant Bible. It was the one that was used in many churches. It was not the official Bible, but it was used in many churches, and it was preferred by Puritans and Reformers. And it had notes on it which told people how to interpret the Bible, which becomes important as the next stage. That's a page from the Geneva Bible in a very bad, bad picture, but you can see the amount of notes down the margin. Um, this is a bit from the Geneva Bible, and you can see a note there, by this similitude he teacheth us that we ought not to be discouraged, etc. Right? The chiefest thing that we can desire of God, it says further down. It tells you how to think. Right? Now it's based on the earlier translations, but it's spinning it one way. Um, we have a copy of the Geneva Bible that Governor Drayton gave the university when we opened. A copy from 1595. And that's the inscription there. In, in Drayton's hand. After Queen Elizabeth came in, it was the Catholics who were in exile. And they Catholic priests set up colleges at Reims and then at Dewey. Um, and in due course, the pressure for a Bible in English was such that there's a Catholic translation of the Bible into English from the Vulgate, not from Erasmus's new Greek text. And that becomes the standard. The Reims Dewey Bible becomes the standard for Catholics through into the 20th century so that they have a different version of the Bible with the apocryphal books uh, still fully integrated. But we have copies of that as well. And the Catholic priests were executed if they tried to come back into England 
mean, it's horrific if you think about it now, the amount of suffering for religious ideas at this time, on one hand and on the other. Um, so the motives and the making of the King James Bible are not that nobody knows the Bible in English. The Bible's been in English. It's that things are falling apart. Things seem violent. There's no agreement. And he wants to stabilize things. When they come to the Hampton Court Conference in 1604, the very last thing he wants is to say, gee whiz, this is a chance to make the church in England more reformed or go backwards and make it more careful. He wants to stabilize things. He wants people to stop thinking uh, in the ways they've been doing. It's a sly man. He wasn't a very nice man. In the same way as you wouldn't choose Henry V if you were trying to plan religious improvements, you wouldn't necessarily choose James VI and I. He was a very proud and vain man. He thought he knew better than the scholars. He was really very rude to old Dr. Reynolds, who was in his 60s, who had to approach him and beg him on his knees, you know, and this kind of stuff. Humiliating people. Um, not a nice man. And yet great good came from this. Dr. Reynolds said, we need a new translation, because it should know about the original languages. The earlier translations don't, didn't know the original languages, the bishops and the great Bible. And James, flattered by the idea that he's learned and would want something in the original language, yes, do that, but none of those notes which are in the Geneva Bible, right? We don't want any of those notes. And that's a straight put down of poor old Reynolds. And he put together groups of translators. There were three, it was called the Company of Translators. There were three teams of six people each three teams in Cambridge, three in Oxford, and three in London. And they would translate and circulate the, the bits they were meant to translate, and then they would be swapped with other teams, and then they would be sent to a central revising committee, which is where James's people could make sure nothing got past them. Right? So partly to do with government control and the bishop's control. One of the reasons why they were so strong on control was they really felt there were terrorists out there going to blow them up. Uh, immediately after the King Jane, after the Campton Court Conference, you have Guy Fawkes. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, gunpowder treasonous plot. Um, probably it was government agents who had suckered these idealistic Catholic aristocrats into thinking they were going to be able to blow up Parliament. And then they were immediately caught, and then they were horribly executed. But it, it was in people's mind that our religious freedom is at stake, that the government is under pressure, right? And whatever we do must stabilize things. And that was part of the background to the King James translation. But those translators were honest men, uh, many of them, and, and learned men. Here are three of the translators, old Dr. Reynolds, in Oxford, Bishop Lancelot Andrews, who was in a sense the king's enforcer in all this, but was a great preacher, not a particularly nice man, but a great preacher. And Henry Savile, who was a learned layman, one of the few laymen on this, Provost of Eton, warden of my college in Oxford, translated Chrysostom in a great big edition, had research assistants, I mean he had the money to pay to become a scholar. All of these people couldn't work independently. They had to work together. The Puritans and the High Episcopalians had to, and the bishops had to work together at some level, even if the last word was done by the king's henchmen on the revising route. And the result was the King James Bible of 1611, which I've talked about a little bit before. It's a great achievement. It really is. And it had to be printed by people, right? Workers. The king's printer couldn't do it. He had to take in a partner. And 
every page meant on one side pulling this heavy press twice and on the other side pulling this heavy press twice. And they didn't have enough type for it, so they set up a little bit and then they printed that, and then they set up a little bit and they printed some more. And they couldn't print enough copies eventually for this authorized thing, so they had to print it again that year, which meant setting the same type again, which is why there's the He Bible and the She Bible. Uh, and the thing which drove them, in a sense, was they had a monopoly. The king's printer had a monopoly on printing Bibles, official Bibles, and this became more and more valuable. Eventually, the University of Oxford and Cambridge could do it too, which is why one often gets Bibles, which <coughs> Oxford Bibles. Um, and in Scotland, there was a king's printer, but it was a monopoly. And why was it a monopoly? Because they didn't want variant versions to get past them. Right? They wanted it, but they couldn't stop people printing the Geneva Bible because that wasn't authorized at that point. So the Geneva Bible continues alongside the official one. When they reprinted it, they had to reset it. They made mistakes. And there's a little bit in the exhibit here which is about some of the mistakes. Um, the most famous one is the so-called Wicked Bible, which has the phrase, Thou shalt commit adultery. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a misprint. Almost certainly one printer paid one of the workers for another printer to make the mistake in so that he, it would get pulled and he'd lose his reputation and he'd be fined. Right? Dreadful conflict in a sense. Later there are mistakes which are simply misprints. It's very, very difficult, hand printing, to get all these things right. Um, the vinegar Bible is where vineyard, the parable of the vineyard becomes the parable of the vinegar. Um, but as a whole, given that this is a hugely difficult undertaking, for, for a long time, you, there's no easy way of reprinting until the 19th century. For an enormously long time, people kept this text and this translation as accurate as they could. It becomes dominant, and it becomes dominant not immediately. England falls apart after King James, you get Charles I, you get civil war, the Puritans take over, the Geneva Bible takes over again. 1660, people are fed up with war, and they bring back the monarchy. And when they bring back the monarchy, they bring back the Episcopal Church. When they bring back the Episcopal Church, they bring back the King James Bible and the Book of Common Prayer the same language, the language of Cranmer and the language of the King James translation has become standard. It becomes standard for everybody. Though there's an act of uniformity in 1662 which says everyone must go to church and no one can participate in politics who has dissenting views, in practice there were communities of dissenters, people who did not go along with that. And two of the most famous of those writers who come from that tradition featured in the, in the exhibit actually. They had metrical psalms in churches is one of the ways in which biblical language came in. But John Milton's Paradise Lost is soaked with the authorized version, although Milton would have been brought up with the Geneva Bible. By the 1660s, he's soaked in, in the language of it. And Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Bunyan was a Baptist tinker, right, from Bedford. He's soaked in the King James Bible, one of the most popular books. We have a great big Bunyan collection in there. That's the 20th edition by 1722. Right. So people have read this and it's, it's quoting all the way. And the Bible was read in people's homes. This is Robert Burns, The Cotter's Saturday Night. Um, in the 1780s, he remembers his father gathering the family on Saturday night and opening the great half Bible and reading passages aloud, bowing his patriarchal head and reading the passages aloud. So it was part of the culture completely. And the phrases of the King James Bible during this period of dominance from 1660 to 1960 enter the language completely. And I'm sure people will have talked about this earlier, but if we just look at these ones, all of these phrases right, come from the King James Bible, all have passed into the language, and I could have had tons more. The souls of the earth, the path of the path, 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 the path of
Two by two, the face of the deep, the skin of my teeth, sour grapes, through a glass bathroom, whited sepulchre, a drop in the bucket. Lean years, the apple of his eye, the tons of men and angels, they toil not, neither do they spin. Filthy lucre behind the veil, without form and void, bread upon the waters, eat, drink, and remain, fight the good fight. All these languages, all these phrases, which have a context when they're in the Bible, but they carry a lot of value with them into the general culture uh, as they become part of the language. So, that dominance, that shared, shared translation has enormous impact and it becomes in due course. What we think of as what a Bible looks like was not the way the Bible looked. The text was the same. It's not till the late 19th century that the Bible begins to look like this um, when they invent India paper, when they can reprint from plates so they don't have to reset every time. They can print on this very thin paper. You can get a Bible in something you can carry or hold in your hand, which alters the way people read it. Um, and these special these edges, are called yap edges, they were invented by a bookbinder in Hereford, England. Those flappy edges to protect the thin paper. That's, that's really invented. The Bible started looking like that in about 1870, 60 or 70. But the words were the same from 1611 onwards. Still. Bible in America, I'm going to go quite quickly. The Pilgrim Fathers did not bring the King James Bible over here. They brought the Geneva Bible. They wanted the Bible of the Puritans. And this is a Bible which is alleged to be John Alden's Bible that came over on the Mayflower, which sits in our vault. It was in dreadful condition. It's been badly restored. But that is the page where John Alden talks about, which is his book. Um, the first Bible printed in America was not in English. It was a translation done by a man called John Eliot, who was a minister up in Boston, Groxbury, north of Boston, who translated the Bible into Algonquin for the Indians and had it printed in 1663 and it was reprinted in the 1680s. So the idea of translation is not just for oneself, uh, but for other people. The first Bible printed in America was at the time of the Revolution. There was a royal monopoly before. In any case, it was cheaper to import Bibles from England than it was to print them, do all that work setting them up in the hand press era. But Robert Aiken, the man who printed the journals of Congress, and therefore you know, there are pages with the Declaration of Independence printed by this man, after 1776 set out to print the first English Bible printed in America, and he did in 1781 to 82 in Philadelphia, and he took it to Congress, and Congress sent it to their chaplains to get a report on whether this was a good edition, and they say that it's extremely <coughs> accurate, right? Executed with great accuracy as to the sentence, and with as few grammatical and typographical errors as could be expected in an undertaking of such magnitude. Right? Um, and he hopes that Congress will give him the same status that the King's Printer has in England. And they don't quite, but they do say this. This is a resolution of Congress in 1782, that the United States in Congress assembled highly approves the pious and laudable undertaking of Mr. Aiken. They recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States and authorize him to publish this recommendation. So it's authorized, but it's not authorized. But it was the King James Bible that they were authorizing. It was to do with local production, part thing. But it's one of the, the only books to be given that kind of congressional endorsement. And it affected people of all strands in American society. Um, that's Phyllis Wheatley. We've got Phyllis Wheatley's poems on the web from the library. And she views religion as the great gain that had come to her uh, from slavery, as in some sense balancing things. Lincoln, Lincoln's second inaugural address, cites the importance of the Bible for people on both sides of the Civil War. This is the Lincoln Bible on which he took his oath and on which 
the current president took his own. Um, it was printed in 1853. And this is, I think, a striking passage. It's, I'm sure we, people have talked about this earlier in this series because of the focus of the series. If you take the great passage from Isaiah chapter 40 in Martin Luther King's speech, and then you go back 600 years to John Wycliffe. You don't have the same passage exactly. King's is based on the King James Version of 1611. But you get many of the same, same rhythms. Each valley shall be enhanced, and each mountain and little hill shall be made low, and twisted things shall be made straight things, and sharp things shall be made plain ways, and the glory of the Lord shall be shown, and each man shall see it together. It's the same rhythms. There's great cultural continuity in it, and I think that's been a lot of the force of the King James Bible. After the King James Bible, Bibles got cheaper in the 19th century, they got very widely disseminated, and, and people could buy the King James text in a much greater variety. It was spread throughout the world, right? It was part of not just the British Empire, but the American trading area, and so on. A lot of the world learned English through the Bible. The Bible societies in Britain, uh, British Foreign Bible Society was into translation and also reprinting for overseas. The Bible Society in America was much more strongly originally in, in terms of making cheap Bibles available so that a lot of people could have them, um, but then went into translation later. And the Gideons in the 20th century have disseminated the King James Bible. I think they only disseminate the King James Bible. The American Bible Society at one point decided that it needed a more attractive translation, um, uh, and a more up-to-date translation. But there's a, a huge force, and the biggest part of this worldwide dissemination of the Bible is in the King James Bible, um, at least till the 1960s. What changed it partly was German scholarship. The scholarship in the King James Bible in 1611 was cutting edge scholarship. This was as good as the scholarship could get from these people. Some of those translators knew six or twelve languages, ancient languages, who were working on the King James Bible. It isn't just a matter of style. By the 19th century, people were looking at other biblical manuscript traditions. And scholars, if you look at those grey men, bishops and 19th century scholars on the right. By the late 19th century, even English scholars and American scholars felt they must catch up with this new learning. And they produced a new translation called the Revised Version in Britain, called the American Standard Version over here. And it was all the time they were looking over their shoulder at the King James Bible. They're trying to be scholarly, but they're not, in fact, doing a new translation. And they got completely clobbered. All the traditionalists got on them and said, you're betraying the true translation. And all the scholars said, you haven't really translated it. And they got squeezed. And the revised version never took off. It's never really ever been more than what people look at as a study version, even in its heyday. But they were serious people. Headmaster of my high school was the secretary of the New Testament Revision Company. His 20 years of his life went to this. Um, and nobody took any notice, really, except to say it was wrong. Mm -hmm. In our time, from the 60s onwards, there have been lots of translations. These are three of the most heavyweight of them. New English Bible, done from Oxford University Press, the Revised Standard Version, the original Revised Standard Version, which was very much the style of the King James Bible, but though modern textual scholarship intended to be liked by conservatives in that version. Jerusalem Bible, which was a new Catholic translation uh, of the Bible, um, taking account of modern scholarship, and not just translating the Vulgate. 
Later you get ones which are much more paraphrases, which are much more concerned with who it's translated for rather than just with what it's translated from. Um, the New International Version is, in its first version, a very serious translation, scholarly translation. The others are more paraphrases, but all of them are concerned with who that's translated for uh, a great deal. And this is what we end up with. I showed you the Complutensian Polyglot way back, all the different versions of the Bible in parallel across the page. And I could have shown you some other ones, but the files were too big to come on them. Here is a book produced in 1974 with six parallel translations. And if you go to church, you can't be sure who's going to read from what. <laughs> People can't follow it, and they don't remember it, because it's all in parallel. And what this really shows you is what the King James translators accomplished for so long was a common translation, not to be accepted again. Out of many translations, one principal translation, not to be accepted again. It was that common shared culture which they accomplished with their translation, often for the wrong motives. But if you were designing religious freedom and profit and, 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 and truth. You wouldn't do it that way. These were human people with the most mixed of motives doing this, and yet it accomplished that for so long, for 300 years. This translation accomplished the idea for English speakers of a common religious standard and reference, uh, an echo for all the people listening to it. Um, don't think we have that in the same way now. But the, the reason that the, the 400th anniversary was celebrated so much and that this exhibit was put together is to some extent because this is an important part of the history of many people in America and across the globe. Not just a matter of history back then, but an important part of our shared heritage and experience. Uh, and that's where I want to end. <laughs>